Okay, let's let's start with with some numbers, maybe it's well, I'm not very unusual. You see that you're still the number one destination of the world, 478 million tourists. Uh, uh, and this is uh, something which uh, uh, will not be easy for us to, to keep this leadership because clearly there are other destinations that are competing against Europe that are trying to get the biggest chunk of the market, especially location tools. So uh, we have to think about this need to digitalize it to be now also in the context of the competition for, for the future share of the tourist market. You see that it's the third largest economic activity that quite few people who realize this actually dominated by SMEs, 10 percent of the GDP, where the provision jobs. What is important, there is a large share of employees who are aged below 25, and this shows really the potential to address the use of employment. And it has a, 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 a lot of spin-over effects. So agro food transport, construction, culture, etc. It's not really made. Uh, in a sense, uh, it is also potentially one of the uh, one of the markets that could absorb at least part of the migrants that are today in Europe. So, okay. So as I mentioned, by, by if you if give you one more figure, by 2030, the international arrivals are predicted to grow from among 1.1 billion and 2 billion, with more than 500 million potential tourists coming from Asia alone. So this is something which is which is in the future. This is something we have to think about. And if this materializes, if we are able to make a, 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 to get our share in this market we could create every year around 500,000 jobs. So this is, this is quite a lot, especially that many of those jobs can be created in the south of Europe that is spread now by the crisis in the countries like Spain and Greece. Now, let's, let's look a little bit now at digitalization. I think it's quite clear that there is a huge potential for digitalization of tourists in Europe which is not only interesting in a sense that it gives you more competitiveness, gives you more edge, but also makes the work to be said to more interesting, more interesting. Uh, and maybe for some of you this could be a problem. But I would say right now it's not very encouraging. I mean, we have a strategic policy forum on digital entrepreneurship where we talk to companies from all over Europe. And this report finds that more than 40% of EU companies in general haven't adopted any advanced technologies so far such as mobile, social media, cloud computing, or big data. And this is even more uh, urgent and difficult in terms sector because I mentioned it's predominantly made up by small and medium enterprises. So I recently spoke to Minister responsible for tourism in Scotland, and he told me that out of more than 10,000 SMEs that are active in tourism in this region, only 20% of them can give electronic points, and only 30% of them have the offer available on, on the website. So you see here what's the, what's the potential of this organization. Now, collaborative economy. I think that tourism is one of the sectors that are most affected by this phenomenon. And uh, uh, undoubtedly, and unstoppable, it will be changing the way the, the tourist works. So it's very disruptive, changes the way the consumers think about traveling tourism. It is not a new concept because we had already about standards of the collaborative economy, but the emergence of online platforms as Airbnb, Chrome, Hawaii, Cross Surfing, Book Locker, Uber, and many others has really accelerated the valuation of these models. And clearly, these platforms are making it easier for those offering services to connect with the consumers. So, people offering the home as tourist accommodation, the knowledge of the home city for tour guiding, or the dining room for culinary experience, or in Spain, of local dishes can now reach out to practically unlimited number of travelers. Then we come to there. So, uh, uh, just to give you an idea of the size of collaborative economy tourists. Hotrek, which is the European Association of Hotels, Restaurants and Cafes, 
estimated accommodation sharing is now double the size of accommodation offered by traditional hotels in Europe. Airbnb, for example, has over 1 million properties in almost 200 countries in 2014. If you compare to Skipton, which is a hotel chain, they get 215,000 rooms in 76 countries. Airbnb is right now the third most valuable venture capital that company in the world with a with with valuation of 25 billion dollars, whereas higher profits had a market value of about 6 billion. In France, out of all accommodation offerings, over 40% are shared accommodation. And uh, one more example, during the Milan Expo last year, 8,500 collaborative accommodation listings were identified on the most popular platforms. And this is in the city which already has 450 hotels and 400 official hotel accommodation offerings. So it's clear really that collaborative economy services are now part of tourist experience. Uh, and that consumers are really looking for a sort of customized holidays. So what what are we doing as a commission that we have collaborative economy? It was a little bit, she took the reflection of should we regulate the sector, should we do something, should we don't do anything at all? Uh, and we run a, a number of analysis, we run uh, uh, consultations. How many consultations on, on, on platforms which are still available on our, on our website? And then we published in June 2016 the communication on the European agenda for collaborative economy. And what we do there, we 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 refrain from legislating because we think that you know this sector is changing so rapidly. And uh, if you look at the legislative cycle in the Commission or the European Union, it's about two years right now. So the the, the, the regu regulatory intervention might be too heavy-handed and may actually be out of tune with what's happening in this sector. So we decided to act rather as a sort of enabler and uh, uh, give a series of guidelines to the member states what they can regulate and what they should not regulate. And all of this in order to prevent market fragmentation, to prevent cities and regions doing different things that would lead really in a sort of non existent single market in this area. We also publish what is mentioned see here as a series of impulse papers. These are papers on different aspects of collaborative economy, such as market access and liability. Uh, and those papers are also available and uh, published on our website. Um, now, a couple of words about what we do right now. I think maybe I would like to focus on two new initiatives which might be particularly relevant here. One is a blueprint for skills. Um, this is the new approach which we take together with digital employment, and maybe which is a nice example of, of how we, the Commission, also try to work across the silos. And the idea is really that, oh, maybe the starting point is sort of lack of satisfaction of what we did on skills so far, where much of what we have been doing was very much supply driven. So now the idea is that we should move to the demand driven and look at the industry needs and try to deliver through training. So this approach uh, uh, picked up six pilot sectors which is chosen on the basis of the importance of skills for the future and the sort of industrial awareness that these things are important and something should be done. And tourism is one of them. Uh, so right now we are still working with the stakeholders in order to prepare them to take part in, in two calls. One will be under our program, which is called COSME, the program for small and medium enterprises. And this will consist of working together with the industry to map out the skill needs and to come up with a long-term strategy. The second element will be done through Erasmus Plus call of around 4 million euro over four years. And that actually will be available to the partnership with the industry and training institutions to create a platform delivering those skills. So it could be interesting, for example, <laughs> It is the university. So the, the, the idea is that 
there should be at the end of this a self-sustainable platform that would be upscaling the best practices also coming from the industry of skills upgrading or upskilling and giving many people uh, a quick access a sort of forcible career paths uh, in the future. So if I'm a truck, truck driver right now, I'm probably watching all those new technological developments. Rather, I was excited, asking myself, what am I doing in 10 years? And the platform should reply to this. And I think it's very good that we are having this in the, in the, in the tourist sector. The other new thing that is uh, so called smart, or well, it's called uh, industrial modernization platform that has built on smart specialization strategies. Now, smart specialization strategies is something new that the Commission put on the table from this financial perspective, and which every single region in Europe has. Originally, it was done for a sort of precondition for getting money from the Bolivian policy. But this approach has proved so successful that even those regions, like in Sweden and Denmark, that received very little money from us, they actually are very keen on this. And we recently spoke with Americans, and Americans want to actually replicate this approach in Australia their country. Now, in this smart specialization strategy, it's a sort of idea about how, what, what are the strengths of the regions and how you should build on those strengths in order to become a sort of unique. In a, in a certain category. And many of those smart facilities these processes have tourism as one of the priorities. So the idea is to bring those regions together in a sort of European value chain or cross-border approach and help them really come up with the investment projects that could be then helped by us find either private or public funding. We see already some regions who are doing this in the such a really like 3 d printing and they really end up with a concrete investment project. So we think it would be a great idea if something similar would happen in, in tourism. In tourism, maybe that should be uh, uh, formulated in a more, uh, uh, maybe subtle way. Uh, for example, the link between tourism and creative and cultural industries. So those regions who want to do something like this could actually work out a sort of offer, see what type of investment is missing in order to make this offer viable. And pool forces and then help by us by different vital services we want to put away this model to get the funding for, for this. Um, so we had a list of six regions here. Well there are more more, more of those, but we think that, that this approach could be could be very successful and see a lot of interest like, from the member states. I mentioned actually cultural cultural creative industries because it's also one of the ways to, to make a culture to make the tourist offer more interesting and also generating more wealth. Uh, because uh, uh, we will be having the European Tourist Day this year on um, precisely on synergy between tourism and culture and creative industries. Um, maybe the last thing I would like to mention is that again talking a little bit about the future is that this time we managed when, when meeting with the Chinese at the summit in July to, to get the agreement that 2018 should be the year of EU China tour. Now, this is important, and I was listening to you when you were mentioning your canton, your canton establishment and Chinese students uh, because uh, in, in China, normally, a lot of tourists go those places where the government, uh, uh, well, where, where, where the government indicates the story of interest. So we saw in the past there was a China tourist here in Russia, right now in the US, and we saw we see quite a huge increase in the number of tourists. And that's also something where we can help because by 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 nature, Chinese tourists do not come to see one single country, but more than those. So it's important and of cross border by the way. And this is sort of also a big chance for the European tourist industry because, as we, as we observe, the increase in the number of Chinese tourists could be close to 2 million people, and this increase has to be stable. So that's even the experience in countries like Russia. Those people 
tend to come back and it's not a one-off issue. So I think that, that you are well prepared to, to, to get the best of it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>